Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Edit audio. When my wife Mary and I decided to have kids, it, it wasn't a decision that we took lightly. We knew that by using a sperm donor, we were making a choice that would mean our kids would not know half of their biological identities. I always felt that it would be enough if we loved our kids, gave them a good home with solid parents. Mary worried that our kids would at some point be mad at us for them not knowing part of where they came from. Now, we have done our very best to share any information that we have about their biological donor. We chose an open donor who they can contact at 18. And now we have to hope that that will be enough. But it's often hard to know what enough is. Between 1990 and now, the recommendations on how to raise kids you've adopted or had through assisted fertility treatments have drastically changed. Sometimes we wonder if doing our best is enough, if they'll be able to piece together all of their identity. And the truth of the matter is that we have to be prepared as they get older, just in case it's not. Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Hopkins, and this is Well Adjusting, where I talk to people about life stuff, but not in an NPR way. It's more like we're at the bar, having cocktails, getting into your business sort of way. It's it's giving drunk NPR. Oh, and producer Steph is here too. Hello. Today we chat, well, dealing with identity as an adopted child. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Well Adjusting. Today, we have just a really important and a special conversation with a woman named Mia. We're talking about adoption, culture, one's identity, and we're also talking about how feelings of loss can happen even in the most loving and healthy adoptions. And most importantly, just how to find your way with all the feelings. So without further ado, let's just jump right into this conversation. Here we go. My name is Mia Lardier. I am the Emerging Platforms Director at Cosmopolitan. So I grew up knowing I was adopted my whole entire life. Since I was a baby, I knew that I was adopted from Colombia, that my parents went to get me, um, and that is a part of my identity. It's grown and changed within my identity as I've gotten older. And now that I've gone past 30, a part of me still has questions. And I think the relationship with that as a part of my identity also changes. So I guess my question is, how do I adjust my relationship with my adoptedness as I get older um, mm. and to the rest of the way I live my life? Well, I already want to ask a question to your question. Yeah, because I mean, we're, we're gonna we're gonna back it up and we're gonna get into it a little yeah. bit. But I'm already curious as to I, I need you to say more about why you want to change your relationship yeah. to your adoptedness. What does that say more about what that means to you? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest, I guess, transformation in my relationship with my adoptedness um, happened over the past two or three years. Um, it was in relation to the political uprising, the sure. racial uprising in the country, um, particularly with minority folks, mm -hmm. um, specifically black folks. And I think that my, you know, a word that came up during that time was privilege. Right. Um, and what privilege means. And I never considered myself someone to be privileged. Um, right. I grew up in a middle class family. You know, my parents both work full time jobs plus more jobs in order to put us through college. So for me, I never really thought I was privileged. 
And when I thought about my adoptedness and privilege, something that came up was even though I am Latina, even though I'm Colombian, which is a minority race, Mm -hmm. um, especially in the United States, I have inherited some kind of privilege that feels um, and it felt different during that time. I was able to go to college. I I never had to pay any student loans. You know, I live in New York City, one of the most expensive places in the world. I work at an amazing job and I feel like I've earned so much privilege and I've had so much privilege that I might not have had in what I call like my second life, which would have been had I not been adopted in Colombia. And especially as someone who is lighter skinned, I feel like I have privilege there. Um, And so, yeah, so that was one of the things that's grown and changed, I think, in my relationship with adoptedness. But I guess maybe it isn't so much changing my relationship, but navigating the new feelings that come up with it as I get older and as my experiences change. Tell me more about the new feelings. Like, mm-hmm. let's let's start there because I feel like your question. First of all, it's so big. It's so big, right? It's so big, <laughs> and it's so complicated, and it's so like I have an image of like a web or like a more like weaving of it all like woven together. Yeah, because it's you're mentioning all these layers, and we yeah. haven't even started to talk about your relationship to your adopted parents yeah. and you know if you're searching for yeah. your um, biological parents mm-hmm. like there's just like there is layers and layers yeah. and layers to this so i initially my instinct is i just want to pull some of this apart yeah. so we yeah. can like see where it is yes i think one of the things is sometimes i don't feel like i'm worthy of my identity as a, a latina person as a colombian person because um, of the privilege even not, though it was like the, yeah not because of the privilege so to give you a little bit more background and more details of the story so my parents my adopted parents are both italian american okay and so i grew up in an italian cultured house and so it was you know um sauce on sundays meatballs yeah, yeah. Um, all the best stuff going to a lot of funerals <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, then having the gravy after yes and you know my parents did their best to try and integrate me into colombian culture they would bring me to lapa meetings which were Latin American Parents Association uh, meetings, and they would do special things for the kids there. And there was some point, I guess, went from middle school to high school mm-hmm. where it was n- not on me, but it felt more on me to kind of like dig into my my culture, my Colombian culture. I learned how to speak Spanish, as, mm-hmm. as most people do in the United States and, and high school. I continued it through college. And, you know, I feel like there are points where I'm like, you know, I know a lot about Italian culture because I grew up in it and it feels very natural to me. But like I didn't have a quinceanera. And as I'm learning as I get older, a lot of Latin American people haven't had quinceaneras either. But, you know, there's sometimes I don't feel like I've earned my card, um, my my identity card. And one of the things that's come up more recently is um, especially living in New York, there are people who speak all different languages. Mm -hmm. And I am often on the subway platform. It always happens on the subway or on the subway platform. And someone will come up to me who doesn't speak English and only speak Spanish. And they ask right. me if I speak Spanish. And, and, I, and I do my absolute best to help them. But sometimes when I can't communicate in Spanish, I feel like, oh, I failed again. Like I failed by people. Yes. And it's like the, I I don't see myself as looking a certain way. Like I don't feel like I fit a certain ethnic mold. Right. Um, to other people, it's, I guess, nice to know that I do because I don't feel it in my heart all the yeah. time. And so, yeah, so it's like I always feel like I'm trying to pass a test that's making me worthy enough to claim my identity too. Yeah. Like I have to just be like full disclosure, honest. Like I am coming into this interview with a prism of like both of my kids um, – it's it's not the same, but because I'm a, we're a two mom household, yeah. but it's like we have there's a thing where like Mary adopted them, my wife and yeah. where they, they have a sperm donor. And, and I have always approached it like if I if I tell them everything from birth and we add on that story and we do all those yeah. things we're supposed to do, then everything's going to be OK in the end. Yeah. So there's like a little piece on my heart that's just like, fuck, yeah. like, it's like it's there no matter what you do, because I think there's some biological components to it and there's some pieces and there's always that like what if over there doesn't you know for you it's your adopted parents for me my kids it'll probably be their sperm donor yeah or maybe it won't I don't know like I'm gonna see what happens so I just have to like call myself out on that that like like I'm struggling a little to like I have to I'm like Robin you have to put that aside because you know I'm a parent you know and it's like and it, it leads me to to wonder like is there also a piece of yours about your adopted parents? Like, Mm -hmm. is there anything in there as well? Are you talking to your parents about this 
like your struggle? Is this open in your family? You know, I think for some parts, especially the language barrier, you know, my parents are just so impressed that I can speak two languages and it is impressive and it's fun. Um, But I think that for a lot of these kind of identity conversations, they're more like they're lighthearted in my family because it is funny that like, you know, I we, I grew up in, in this culture and I still have another culture that I can lean back on in a way. So, you know, a lot of the conversations with my family are more lighthearted. They they don't all come up um, because a lot of them, I, I think I'm still working through and I'm mm-hmm. not, you know, super, I don't have all the words to say and I don't know how, you know, my my adopted parents would take it. They, they're so supportive of me and they would let me explore that identity however I want. You know, they never once questioned if I had the opportunity if, to go back to my birth parents, let's yeah. just say. Like the connection is very secure. They're my mom and dad. Yeah. So they would be like, how can we help you? Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't feel any guilt or anything on that side of the thing? No, not okay. at all. Well, then that's yeah. at least one good, good thing. Yes. So yeah. it's really about identity then. Yeah. It's about like where I come from, like these like larger than life questions. Yeah. And I think the one other experience that I've kind of, you know, I think as I get older, there's so many different little hoops that you go through mm-hmm. and you learn about different things. And, you know, some things kind of click easily. Others take a while to just reflect on. Um, But one of the things that the side journeys is, especially as many young women do in this country specifically, um, I struggled a lot with body image throughout my Mm -hmm. teen years and even in college. I would high five you if anyone was still (laughs) high fiving, but they're not. So I won't. Yeah, I had an eating disorder. um, And I think a lot of my body image issues were just not knowing what my body was supposed to look like. Because I grew up in, you know, my, my Italian-American family that, you know, they have a certain body type. Yeah. But as all young women did in America in the 90s, they looked up to all of the skinny people who yeah. had very sure. different bodies than I did. And it didn't happen until like the past five to 10 years where people, you know, a lot of more, um, a lot more like reggaeton artists came out and a lot of more Latina women were put to the front where I'm like, Oh, she has curves. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she has legs. Yeah. Oh, she has thighs. I'm like, that's so refreshing. I'm like, that's what I've been fighting against my entire life. My body just wanted to do a certain thing. So I think the body image part of it, I was like, oh, I just had to wait and see and like connect with other people who fit the same kind of, you know, background that I do, the same history that I do to kind of, you know, come to terms with that. So a lesson I learned from that side journey was just how about you just look at and talk to other people yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. that are in your in your circle without feeling any fear or fear of judgment from them? All right, people, raise your hand if you have ever been personally exhausted by email, right? Same, friend, same. We're all so constantly inundated with email. And if you're like me, going through your inbox becomes less about responding to everything and more about just finding a way to keep tabs on the messages that really matter, you know, like the ones from the school telling me my kids are in trouble that I get all the time. Anyway, that's where SaneBox comes in. Think of it as an EMT for your email. As messages flow in, SaneBox does the triage for you, sifting only the important emails in your inbox and directing all the other distracting stuff, you know what I'm talking about, into your Sane Later folder. So you know what messages you need to pay attention to now and what stuff you can get to like, you know, like eventually after maybe a nap or I don't know, a cocktail. It also, and I I know I'm waxing poetically, but it has some very handy features like the same black hole where you can drag messages from annoying senders that you never want to hear from again. Bye, friend. Oh, and it also has sane reminders to ping you if someone hasn't replied to your email by a certain date. I mean, nothing like having to follow up on your follow-up, am I right? All right, best of all, you can use SaneBox with any email client or phone anywhere you check your email. I mean, come on. See how SaneBox can magically remove distractions from your inbox with a free two-week trial. That's a deal. Visit SaneBox.com slash well today to start your trial, and you're going to get a $25 credit. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash W-E-L-L. Go ahead, folks. Get it. Have you... um? Have you done any investigative work about your origins? 
I've done a 23 and me. I gave my spit to whatever. <laughs> so they can use it for God knows so how they they're can, using yeah, it. Yep. So they can clone me forever. Probably. Um, and yeah, so I am uh, basically mostly like Spain, Spanish and partially like um, indigenous to Latin America. OK. Yeah. That's like 98 percent of my makeup. And did any relatives come up? Yes. The closest I had on 23andMe was um, a third cousin. And I think sometimes, like, I'm like, oh, I should reach out. And I have. Um, well, was it a closed adoption? Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. yeah. I, I, so there's no way to get I, other than if they, if they show up on 23andMe. Yes. Yeah. So I have um, the name of my birth mother, but not my birth father. Um, okay. Only my birth mother's name was on my birth certificate. Okay. And so um, the closest I got was a third cousin. And I think I feel like I get – it's like being on a diving board. Like I get so far and then I some fears come up like what if they have – bad intentions and in connecting with me? What if okay. um, right. they, you know, ask me questions that I'm not comfortable about? What if they want to get too close to my my current, like I want to protect my current family too. Right. Um, so I haven't gotten very far in connecting with any relatives that I, I know of. Okay. Interesting. Do you have siblings? Yeah. So I, I have one sister. Um, she is not my biological sister. My parents struggled with infertility for mm-hmm. many, many years. So they um, finally got me. And then about two to three years later, they had already put in for a second adoption from Colombia. And they were so close to being placed with a baby from there. And my mom, she had been eating lots of chocolates. She um, started to like she was a little bit more frazzled than normal. Um, she had never had like regular periods. I'm outing my mom's periods here, but she had never had regular periods. <laughs> shout and, out to mom's and periods. She, yeah, and she had spots. <laughs> shout out. She had been spotting for a little bit. Um, and but my dad's like I, apparently in her Christmas stocking that year, he gave her a pregnancy test. And he's like, I think you should take this. And so she took it and she was pregnant. She was six months. And this story is so common. Yes. She was six months pregnant. (gasps) Six months. Six months. And she was barely showing. So, yeah. So she. Kind of like an adoption, too, though. Like you're you're having a baby. Yeah. So um, my sister was born. And so we're very different. Some people sometimes think that we're biologically related. But yeah. And I don't know if I have any other um, siblings that are out there that are biological. All right, people. Raise your hand if you have ever been personally exhausted by email, right? Same, friend, same. We are all so constantly inundated with email. And if you're like me, going through your inbox becomes less about responding to everything and more about just finding a way to keep tabs on the messages that really matter, you know, like the ones from the school telling me my kids are in trouble that I get all the time. Anyway, that's where SaneBox comes in. Think of it as an EMT for your email. As messages flow in, SaneBox does the triage for you, sifting only the important emails in your inbox and directing all the other distracting stuff, you know what I'm talking about, into your Sane Later folder. So you know what messages you need to pay attention to now and what stuff you can get to like, you know, like eventually after maybe a nap or I don't know, a cocktail. It also, and I I know I'm waxing poetically, but it has some very handy features like the same black hole where you can drag messages from annoying senders that you never want to hear from again. Bye, friend. Oh, and it also has sane reminders to ping you if someone hasn't replied to your email by a certain date. I mean, nothing like having to follow up on your follow up. Am I right? All right. Best of all, you can use SaneBox with any email client or phone anywhere you check your email. I mean, come on. See how SaneBox can magically remove distractions from your inbox with a free two-week trial. That's a deal. Visit SaneBox.com slash well today to start your trial, and you're going to get a $25 credit. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash W-E-L-L. Go ahead, folks. Get it. So I think what I'm trying to understand is like if you could wave a wand i think Mm -hmm. this might be the best way to ask this question what would you do what would you learn or what would you do or what what would you have access to that might make you feel better that is a great question one of the things that i have not done yet is actually go back to columbia 
Um, mm. I'm 30, going to be 32 this year. So I haven't been back in 32 years. Um, a lot of it was my family being afraid to go back when there are political uprisings, when yeah. there is a little bit more dangerous to go. I now have friends who are from there, you know, people I could meet there. Um, and so there, there's always like, we should go, we should go. And it's just never the right year. So I think first it would be just going back and visiting. I think since it's been so long, since I've been been there, um, you know, I think I placed that trip on a very high pedestal and like wanted yeah. to be perfect. And, and and that's I'd be wary of that. Yes, because I'm like it, because what does it that can't mean? ever meet any expectations if you are setting it up like that. No, and it it likely won't be the key to anything other than just a little more information. Yes. So it's like, it's important that you understand that. Yes. Because when I go, it's not going to be like, oh, I turned a lock and a key and and your heart's going to open open. up and levitate. Yes. I'm going to be so aligned. Levitate. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, So yeah, I think, you know, that's the first thing and just like getting over that hump. Um, You know, I'd love to go back to my my orphanage that I've risked from is still there. Um, And my parents, when they adopted me, before they adopted me, they were super involved there. Like my dad would go and help like do handiwork there. My mom would like bring clothes to donate to the kids and read books and everything. Um, So I'd love to spend some time there and get to know the people who still work there that were a part of my adoption because there are a few. And I think that Spanish, again, is another thing that I, I work on daily. Mm-hmm. Um, I listen to a lot of Spanish music just to, like, keep that fresh in my mind. I so, know, like, knowing the culture and being a part culture, of the culture yeah. more would be a thing you would wish for. Yes. Yeah. And I, I one thing that I've done because I'm like, oh, I, I, wish, I wish I had more time to, like, you know, invest in, like, community work. And I am a part of a Latinx group at my job. Mm -hmm. And it's been so nice to just, like, talk with people and also see that, like, people who grew up in a Spanish household don't speak Spanish. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And that they didn't have. You're putting some pressures on yourself to be a perfect Colombian. And this is typical me, Robin. Right. You don't know me yet, but this is me. Well, I'm getting to know you. (laughs) I'm a type A minus. Hi, cheers. Another high five. You know, but I'm saying like that, that's not helpful to you because there right. is no perfect. That, that'd be like me and Steph trying to be, I mean, Steph being the perfect queer, me being the perfect lesbian. Like right. that does not exist. Right. Although I do own a lot of cargo shorts. Oh, I mean, that's pretty. That's a I lot mean, of points, I think. I don't anymore. I used to. <laughs> but, you, you know, like, so I think noting some of these things yeah. is important for you. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one thing I never want to do is abandon the culture that I was raised in. Like right. Italian-American culture is great. Sure so it many is. people, meatballs. you know. Yeah, meatballs. Um, And like the stories that my family has given me, you know, the history that my family has is just so great. And there's so many interesting parts of it. So that's something. And it's a part of you. Yes, it is. You are a part of Italian culture. Yeah. Period. Full stop. Yeah. So I guess. You have many parts. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, the thing that I forget is that, you know, other people aren't homogenous either. Right. Right. You know, what's so interesting is this old podcast I used to host. um, We had this woman on who had. um adopted a baby. She was a lesbian and she was like a social worker. And she was one of the people that comes into your home to do that social work check when you're Mm -hmm. adopting a baby. And she talked about how there is this, um, this piece for all children who are adopted. This Mm -hmm. like, it's, it's like a, I don't want to say like a missing piece, but there's a piece. There is yeah. a, there's a sense of loss. Even if they were adopted at birth, there mm-hmm. is a connection that is torn that yeah. that will forever and always that will be part of your DNA, right. no matter how great you make that home. And I remember sitting when she said that and being like, yeah. like just like slumped because yeah. I have intentionally done that to both of my children. I know. And and I tell myself all kinds of stories about you know, like I've given them a lovely home and whatever, but there may come a time where I have to see them go through this and it's hard. And, and yeah. I'm sitting here with you, like, and I can feel that this is a piece for you. And I'm getting, yeah. well, weirdly choked up and I apologize, but that does feel like that's a lot of what it is, is that's happening it for is. you. Yeah. I think that another thing that when I've been able to meet other, other folks who are adopted, that's this whole separate part, because there are people who are adopted from all over the world. Um, and as we've come to know over the past, especially like five or 10 years, that there's so much white saviorism and adoption. Yeah. And I've gotten to know some people whose adoptions were much more um, trying than mm-hmm. mine for them, um, a lot more traumatic. Being uprooted from your place of origin is a separation, as you mentioned. And I've known people who have come here to their adopted homes and, and all sorts of things that happened, depression. Um, yeah. We've known people who have been suicidal as a result of this dysphoria um, that exists between that either their identity or their their families. 
And, you know, there are people who have left their adopted homes because their parents ended up being really bad people. Yeah. And that's a part of, uh, you know, especially in the past few years that I've been like, I felt bad that my adoption was so good. Yeah. Um, so much guilt. So very, a lot, Yeah, a lot of guilt. And, you know, I feel so much empathy for the other folks who didn't have the experience that I did because – Growing up, I was like, I'm going to adopt all the babies. Like, I'm like, <laughs> this is great. I was like, I came to this country. My mom and dad are great. My sister's great. Everything's great. And, you know, I think uh, just rethinking that in the past few years, too, because, you know, of course, you know your intentions, but yeah. you just never know, like, what the, the, the it's a whole other person that you're yeah. being brought to your family. So did you feel when you were growing up? Did you feel Latina? <laughs> That's a great question. Um the reference point I give is um, there was the show Taina. I don't know if you both are familiar. Yeah. And I was like, that's going to be me. And I'm like, the way to being Latina is wearing an alligator pink jacket and hoops. And I was like, that's it. And I was like, done. Perfect. We're going to need a picture. Yeah. Please, thank yeah. You. I do have a great picture that okay. I can send you. Um, but, you know, I went to, I, I grew up in New Jersey and most of my my school was was white. And so, you know, I, I didn't feel othered because, again, I'm pretty light skinned. But um, it's like, I don't know. I, I think I, I didn't really know at that point, like what it meant. I was just like, I, I'm Mia. Yeah. Did you have a moment like was it like the uprising in 2020 where you felt like, oh, OK, wait, maybe there has been like. Like, maybe I have been othered in some way by people that, like, don't know that I was raised Italian-American. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. You know, there have been ex- experiences over the – as I've come more into, like, consciousness of what microaggressions are, things like that, I yeah. definitely experienced that. And it hadn't it's realized – like you were in a little that. bubble and you were, had such a lovely bubble yeah. that you didn't even notice things were happening. You were like, boop, yeah. boop. I mean, yeah. this is not the same, but I have, like, a best friend and one of his parents – um, is Italian and the other one is Puerto Rican mm-hmm. and he never really knew the Puerto Rican yeah. one. So he grew up Italian, but he visibly looks like Latinx. Right. Yeah. And has a name that is Spanish. And, yeah. you know, so all of the things. And I remember talking to him when we were like in our late twenties being like, well, you might not consider yourself like Latino, yeah. but like, you're still experiencing like a lot of the prejudice right. that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like, I don't know for him as well, and maybe this is implying the same thing towards you. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there's like a, uh, like I'm not Latin enough, but I'm also Latin enough. Like I'm getting yeah, the prejudice, but I'm not fitting enough. Absolutely. Like there's a friend of a friend who um, I was around recently and this person made a joke which was not a joke. Uh-oh. I've heard a few other choice remarks from this person. And I was just like, that's it. I was like, this guy really sucks. And I, This fucking guy. Yeah. And it's, of course, you know, uh, the 2020, you know, uprising of everything made a lot of this more clear that that's absolutely not OK. And, yeah. and but he didn't think that it would offend me because, right. you know, I don't look a certain way right. or because my last name doesn't sound like I'm Latin American. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there is a, a, a point where, you, to your point, Steph, where I do feel my identity enough to to feel offended by that, um, to feel a certain way about events that go on in the world. It, it, this is the only way that I can relate to this. And so I'm going to say it. And I also think it's like kind of hilarious because Robin has a similar thing where like I'm gay. I'm very gay. Mm-hmm. I've been out what? and gay since I was like a baby. <laughs> and I think that I can pass, you know, mm-hmm. I can pass in society as like a straight person. And in a lot of ways that like affords me a lot of privilege and right. a lot of safety. Right. In a lot of ways, it's fucking annoying because I'm like, I just want yeah. this hottie to hit on me. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> But there's that. And I remember there was this feeling that I'm like, OK, I pass in public. So I'm like not getting like I feel a bit guilty sometimes being yeah. like, well, I'm gay. And so like this. Right. But like I also was kicked out of my house and like right. had all of this other yeah. shit like that was like hard for me yeah. because I'm gay. So yeah. it's like grappling with those two. I do think that the identities. passing. Yeah, I do think yeah. that the passing bit because I do 100 percent feel that way. But. I think I'm a, a little bit older and it I come from a time where you like wanted to pass yeah. because that was like that that was good but there's a a shame like there's a shame on the other side of that coin mm-hmm. there's like I want to fit in I don't fit in like when I would go to gay bars in the 90s I did not feel like didn't feel gay enough mm-hmm. I didn't feel mm-hmm. like and I just felt like I was of two worlds right but right, that's right. why I was asking yeah. like when like did you grow up thinking that you were a Latina cuz I do feel like culturally right now we're in a moment where where it's like, 
Bad Bunny and like, yeah. you know, like there's like very much like an integration more than yeah. when we were young. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. With American culture and Can't like Latinx culture. Can't imagine there was a lot of that when you were growing up in New right. Jersey. No. Of course. Yeah. And you see like Selena Gomez and Camila Cabello. They're like, yeah. they're, they're like, oh, your Spanish doesn't sound good enough. Like yeah. you hear that kind of commentary and it's like, God, they grew up in a, a family <laughs> that maybe didn't speak Spanish all the time. Yeah. I don't know. But so, okay, so we're starting to touch on something, and I want to take that and bring it back to you, Mm -hmm. because I think ultimately, right, the world's going to do what the world's going to do. Like, people are going to be mad at Camila Cabello. Some people are going to say, you're not this, you're not that. But I only give a shit about what you want for you. And I heard a whole bunch of, um, and you have the opportunity to tell me I'm very wrong, (laughs) but I heard a whole bunch of fear around the things that you wanted. Yeah. Like in my head, as soon as you said going back to Columbia, I was like, oh, shit. I was like, she's going to blog this. I was like, I had a whole television show in my head. I was like, this is like amazing. And you're standing on the thing in the, yeah. in the mountains. And and like, yeah, it's all happening. But it's like I hear some fear around that because when you were talking about the fears of the third cousin, um, mm-hmm. like so you just don't. Right. Take their calls anymore. It's yeah. very easy to block yeah. calls. Like there's answers yeah. to all these fears, which is how I know it's fear. Yeah. So yeah. I, I like. While I think it's important that we understand like the broader context, but I you know it's just about you and what you yeah. want because it's it's about you healing something or or learning to live with the duality. I think it's the latter because you know, I, like I've mentioned, it's you know you want to I want to still embrace the culture that I grew up in, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I think that for me it it is a fear. I think as someone whose job depends on storytelling and what's the story, a lot of it is like having that narrative in my mind already that I've already planned around how great this experience will be to visit my home country. Um, You know, and I think you're right that it is kind of like letting go of that a little bit and just taking the journey as it goes um, and see what I learned from that. Or what if what if even like in a reframe, if it's not letting go, if it's looking at it differently, I had an image of like two bags and they're like little tote bags. Yeah. And one bag is like your Italian heritage and your your family and all these. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's full. Yeah. It's brimming full and it's lovely. It's like a beach bag and there's towels and right. there's snacks yeah. and there's alcohol for the beach. Perfect. And it's perfection. And then the other bag is sort of like, you know, in the corner and there's like one or two things in it. And it's, you know, it's sort of just like, like dusty and it's like i just want you to fill that bag like it, yeah. in whatever brings you joy yeah and if it's going there and releasing the pressure on what that trip means yeah i think i added a little pressure by turning it into a television show so let's not do that <laughs> yeah. but like what what and i feel like it would start with naturally just allowing yourself to dream and to to think yeah. about what what would bring you what would what would celebrate your culture what yeah. would make you feel connected to your culture what would bring would would volunteering in a different way bring yeah. you know what would what would fill that bag and that you can fill two bags without taking away from the right one. they're yeah. separate and they're, they're two, separate. and you can hold one in each arm yeah that's why I have a tote bag image because right. it's like you can carry two bags all right. day long and you're yeah. balanced and you're weighted and everything is and it doesn't mean that there won't always be a piece or right. a thing but that doesn't mean it can't be filled and lovely yeah I think that. Um, Again, in my experience so far, it's been the moments of meeting people, um, you know, my best friend growing up was Puerto Rican. And so being in our house and having her mom make food for us and like for me, I was like, oh, this feels great. It's like those little like glimmers that you get to like, again, put in your little tote bag and be like, that feels good. Yeah. Um, being around my coworkers, you know, we just like have a good time. Like that feels good. And there's no label on it. There's a label on it, but because we're in a group, but there's no label on it because it's just an experience that feels good. The moments on the subway that I mentioned earlier where people come up to me and ask me to yeah. help them with You're directions, like it does make me feel shitty in the end when I can't fulfill on a promise and not a promise, but a, a request. But it does make me feel good in the end because it's like, oh, they recognize me as like a part of something. Yeah. Well, there's a common thread in all the things that you're saying that yeah. make you feel good are that you you have a feeling like you belong. Yeah. And yeah. it's like when you make some decision that I, I don't belong because is when yeah. you feel shitty. Yeah. Now I'm getting emotional because oh. that no, that was so nice. Come here. Give me this. Thank you. Give me this. Oh my yeah. God. You know, just as a human being, one of the things that I love to prioritize in my life is making people feel good and making them feel like they belong. Um you know, like I feel even at work, I, I put like a 
I try to, I feel like the camp counselor sometimes. Like, I try and get people to do kickball leagues and things (laughs) like that. Like, it just makes me feel good when people feel good. Um, And so maybe a part of this journey is just, like, a part of the journey all along has been making other people feel good. Yeah. Like, they belong to. But also, you're one of those people. (laughs) Like, you deserve to feel good. And you deserve to be, like to just connect in whatever way feels appropriate and yeah. right. And and like, I feel like you know it in your heart. Yeah. And, and it might be good to, like, I'm not familiar, but there might be some like support groups or folks yeah. who are like, who are struggling with this to have other people who feel just like yeah. you do to help you break it apart and give you more permission. Yeah. And I do have to shout out to like people who I've met who are adopted or were adopted um, and have been vocal in sharing their stories because yeah. I think that people are afraid to – who aren't adopted are, af- are afraid to ask questions. Yeah. And are afraid to talk about it because they feel like they're going to offend. And some people will offend you because they ask really stupid questions. <laughs> um, yeah. But, Being an educator doesn't mean you're not – there's not like the fray that you're going to have to deal with. Yeah. But it really is nice when people like ask you things respectfully. Yeah. Um, and I, I appreciate people who have been vulnerable enough to – open up about their experiences, especially when they're really hard. Yeah. Because it does help other people process their journeys like me. It does. And, and you know, like this whole conversation, I think, is a really great example of, um, and I, Steph and I talk about this all the time, about like what happens when it stays up in your head. Yeah. There's so many threads and they and they do just get all joined and they do get all messed up. And yeah. it's, it's it, I think it's incredibly difficult as a one person who's in the middle of all of these threads to go, oh, well, that's, let me put that over here. And let me, yeah. like, it's really helpful to have someone else pick the things apart. Yeah. And, you know, because all of, at least when it happens to me, all my fears come in, all my self doubt, all the shit that holds me down comes in and yeah. it has a voice. And I don't actually need more of that voice. Yeah. I need a little less of that voice. Yeah, yeah exactly. I always need less of that voice. <laughs> yeah. I think we all do. Yeah. I'm going to give homework. Oh, oh, okay. I love the homework section. I just wanted to say, like, it sounds like there's, like, a, you know, with identity, like, representation is, like, the yeah. first step, right? Like, I can see parts of myself in this and parts of myself in this and feel like I belong in this way or whatever. And you get to sort of, like, pick out the parts that you relate to yeah. and be like, okay, this is where I could fit in among this, like, collage of things that I'm pulling yeah. apart. But I do think that's, like, the first step. And then the second step is, like... Not just seeing it and thinking it, but like feel like owning it. Yeah. You know, and like really Say like, more about that. What does that mean? Like feeling it in your body. Allowing it in. And like therapy speak, I, I feel like what you're saying, Steph, is like when you like label an emotion, like, you know, this is oh. something. Is that what you mean? Like when this is experienced, like labeling it and be like, this is I'm this feeling is, fear. I'm feeling good or I'm feeling alone. Yeah. Just like embodying the thing. Like yeah. I think sometimes I'm like, oh, like, that's along the permission to me, giving yourself permission. Yeah. Also feeling like stoked about it. Like I, you know, sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm a CEO. That's like a little thing. And Mm -hmm. I never really saw like a CEO that I was like, that's a cool, that's a cool CEO. Like I want to say that I'm a CEO because I see this person. So I started looking for a representation of CEOs that I thought were cool and like doing good things. Not that many of them out there, Mm -hmm. but looked for them, found them, was Mm -hmm. like, okay, like this part of this person, this part of this part, this part of this. And now I'm like, okay, now I can like feel it in myself that like I've like made this collage of CEO-ness yeah. and I can like put it in my body and be like, I stand behind this. Like this is one of the things that I am on yeah. the inside. Yeah. Um, not that like being a CEO is my identity, but right. it is part of it. It's part of it. And so like well, it's, feeling it's one that, of the things that you had trouble saying yes to. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so then, oh my God, it is. It's the saying yes now, to Why it. do you think I always make you say it? <laughs> I'm always like, she's a CEO. She's a founder. Okay, like, so this is like about important. me now. Um, well, well, well <laughs> That's in the after hours with. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I do think that like, you know, normally we tell people to like say three nice things about yourself or whatever. I feel like your homework should be like do one thing a week that makes you feel more like you're 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 taking the representation and like feeling it in yeah. your body. So yeah. like whether that's like, you know, being part of groups that like yeah. make you able to vocalize like how you identify mm-hmm. and that this is a part of you or whether it's cooking yourself a Colombian meal for the first time and yeah. perfecting it, like whatever that is, yeah. like just like feeling it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good homework. My homework's more ethereal, I think. Okay. Mine is more like I want you to give yourself permission or like to to vision and to think about, well, like what do you want? Mm-hmm. Like because I think we just started to scratch the surface of that. But like, yeah. like that wave your wand question I think is one that you could probably spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. Like what would the trip look like if 
you had no expectations. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the orphanage. What other groups beyond your work group? Like, might you be interested in what other volunteer opportunities? And then whenever I think, you know, I always use the thing of like the smokers who are trying to quit smoking and they snap the rubber band. band. Like, I think the rubber band snapping for you would be when you start to think about the red flag is when you start to think about what culturally people are going to say about you. Mm-hmm. When anyone outside of you is going to have an opinion about your um, experience, yeah. that means you're out. then you're out of yourself. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so use that as your snapping rubber band to go, oh, I'm out of myself. Well, what do I think about yeah. it? Yeah. Because you are Italian-American and you are Colombian. Mm-hmm. It only matters what you think about you. Yeah. And I think that's part of feeling it in yourself, yeah. too. It's yeah. like yeah. once you feel it as part of you. You own it. It's it doesn't yours. really matter. If people are like, oh, like, ew, Steph's a CEO. I'm like, okay, well, I know I'm good at it. Right. And like, yeah. I'm a good one. And yeah. I'm this collage of CEO, not yeah. the one this person thinks. Yeah. So like, yeah. Fuck all y'all. You. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think I stand by the looking for more people who've gone through the experience of you, like like a support group or something yeah. like that just might be something to just check into. And like you might go yeah. to one meeting and be like, this is not for me. Yeah. But I think it's – you'll know why. Like more information is – great yeah because then you can say like i always say if i'm trying to figure out what my next move is and i don't know if i take an interview with someone like an informational and i chat with them and i'm like well this and i'll go oh i never want to do that job yeah that information is every bit as valuable as them having said this is the perfect job that i want to do for sure because as i build on it i can go oh well i know i hate i know i hate micromanagers so i definitely shouldn't work in this field yeah or yeah. I hate math or, you yeah. know, whatever. I love math, actually. Yeah. But, like, whatever wow. the thing is, is I know, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> but Controversial. I love it. Not even embarrassed. I love it. Love math. Yeah. But, you know, that just that information is important. Yeah. What, but what I find so exciting, so I want to move off the homework because I feel like okay. we've dumped a lot of homework on you. But we feel like you're type A light. I've, I've you got it in my it. folders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, what I think is so wonderful about this is, like, you are on the beginning of a journey. Mm-hmm. And the journey is only going to fill up this other bag. Yeah. It's only going to be more wonderful for you. At yeah. least that's how it feels to me. Yeah, I agree. And I think like in my mind, I feel like I've been on the journey for so long, but this feels like a new chapter. I'm 30, 30 something now when I'm 60 something, that journey will be even different and even yeah. more beautiful, I think. Yeah. I really want to thank you for just opening yourself up. I mean, we, we came into this building because we're in person for this interview. Yeah. We just met you, sat down, talked about donuts for three seconds, and then we were like this. So <laughs> when you were for, so just thank you for of really course. just being willing to share and talk about all this. Of course, I'm so happy to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Thank you also for being one of those people. I mean, you like shout out people that were like brave enough to share their journey with you. Yeah. Like you are hopefully doing that for many so. other people. So thank I you for so. being that brave thank also. You. have reached the well-adjusting expert of the day. My name is Shannon Gibney, and I am a 48-year-old mixed Black domestic transracial adoptee. I am a writer. I am a professor of writing at Minneapolis College. I have just published a novel memoir about my experiences in Search and Reunion, and navigating transracial adoptee identity. One thing that sort of, you know, irritates adoptees is that we are not seen as experts in our own experiences. Most of the time when we are talking about adoption, the people that are are dominating the conversation are the people in agencies that facilitate the adoptions and then white adoptive parents. Those historically have been the people that have been framing and running the conversation. So I, I really do appreciate you reaching out to me and um, actual adoptees. The thing is, adoption is a, a structurally isolating experience. So for, for instance, me as a child in the 80s and a teenager in the 90s in Ann Arbor, Michigan, there were other transracial adoptees in my community around me, but we didn't have a language to identify that. The, the, the social and cultural isolation of an adoptee makes you feel like you're a freak. That's the negative side of it. But the quote unquote positive side of it also is that you feel like you're special in some way. Um, and so what happens is when you get together with other adoptees, when you start reading literature written by adoptees, you start watching films created by transracial adoptees, you realize that you're not special. You also realize that you're not a freak. What you realize is that 
this is what happens to the psychology of a person raised under these conditions. This is how somebody moves through the world when they've been socialized by white people. When they phenotypically look black, they look Latinx, but they can't necessarily perform the culture. And so that can be very freeing. Um, my dear friend, Dr. J. Ron Kim has a blog, um, Harlow's Monkey, and there's tons of resources on there. At the end of our book, When We Become Ours, there's a list of all kinds of resources. Also for my memoir as well. Again, books, films, podcasts. I have a, a text group. There's four of us. And that is just like such a place of comfort and just a place that I can always kind of come back to with my questions for additional perspectives. You know, our experiences are not the same. They're mostly Asian American women. You know, I'm a, a Black American woman. But the experiences of racial and cultural isolation, the sense of shame that you feel in your own um, body a lot of times, your own social and cultural group, not being able to connect, at least in the same way initially, with other people in your same racial and cultural group. All of those were things that um, we had in common and that we could talk about and then establish a language together. Because the thing about establishing a language, you can't create a language on your own. You, you have to do it with other people. So it's about community is what I'm saying. I mean, I think the ultimate goal is self-actualization and filling in those narrative gaps in a society that really values at least the appearance of a seamless personal and family history, right? Which adoptees don't have. And not pretending everything's okay. But, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. That's a very common response from adoptees, right? Like, no, it's okay if you're pissed. Nobody wants to be the angry adoptee. Like, no, I personally, right, we always have to be like, preface everything. Well, I have a great relationship with my family, you know, like, or whatever. Like, I'm not, like, it's like, why? Why do we have to say that? I have plenty of friends who aren't adoptees who have shitty relationships with their parents. And like, they don't have to backtrack before they talk about that, right? So it's like, just finding a way to rest in the complexity um, and to be who we are and to not feel like we need to somehow constantly explain it or justify it, I guess, to ourselves and someone else. And, you know, that very well could be a lifelong journey. And it certainly looks different, you know, from adoptee to adoptee. Okay, folks, that is a wrap for this episode. But before we go, I do want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Mia for your openness, your vulnerability, and your willingness to really just look at this issue and see what is present. And a big thank you to our expert of the day, Shannon Gibney, for sharing her journey, her wisdom on this topic. And if you want more information about Shannon, you're just going to head to shannongibney.com. That's in the show notes for more information on her books, her events, and whatnot. For more Robin, and you may need that, you probably don't need it, but like if you do, you can follow me at Real Rob Hops on all the platforms, all the socials, as the kids today say. Well Adjusting is an edit audio original, exec produced by Steph Colburn and Robin Hopkins. Thank you to Maria Passingham, Kathleen Speckert, and the whole edit audio team. Oh, hey, before you take out those AirPods, this show is just for entertainment. If you are in need of help, please, please, please reach out to a professional. Go ahead and get that help. You deserve it. Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. 
They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com.